During the reign of Henry VIII, the Tudor court was a murky world of intrigue, backstabbing and ambition. Hundreds of noblemen and women jostled to be in the king's favour. Those that succeeded won power, influence and immeasurable wealth. Those who failed faced banishment, ruin or even death. I'm Tracy Borman. I'm a Tudor historian. And for me, the most mysterious and intriguing person at court wasn't Henry himself, or his chief minister, Thomas Cromwell, or even any of the six wives. It was someone you've probably never heard of. Her name was Jane Boleyn. Jane was right at the center of Henry's court for over two decades. She was Anne Boleyn's sister-in-law and served five of Henry's six queens. Some say she was a spy for Cromwell. Some say she gave evidence that led Anne Boleyn and her own husband to their death. She's been called the most evil and manipulative woman in the Tudor court. The story goes that she schemed to remove a potential rival from the king's affection from court. And she is often blamed for the execution of Anne Boleyn. She's perjured herself on behalf of the king to ensure that his divorce goes through. Has history been fair to Jane Boleyn? Was she really a traitor, a schemer, a spy? I'm going to re-examine the evidence against her and try to find out who she really was. In May 1536, England was plunged into crisis. Henry VIII's second wife, Anne Boleyn, and her brother George had been arrested and thrown into the tower. Henry's chief henchman, Thomas Cromwell, began the task of gathering evidence against them. Anne was accused of adultery with five men, and most sensationally of all, one of them was her own brother. Near the top of Cromwell's list for questioning was one of the most notorious women at court. She also happened to be the wife of George Boleyn and the sister-in-law of Anne. She was the 33-year-old Jane Boleyn, also known as Lady Rochford. Why was Jane so important? Well, of course, she was George's wife and she was also a lady in waiting to the Queen, so she knew both their secrets. For hundreds of years, many of the history books have cast Jane as an evil, vengeful woman, claiming it was her evidence that put her husband and sister-in-law in the dock. A Tudor historian writing in 1576, so more than 30 years after Jane's death, says it is reported of some that this Lady Rochford, that's one of Jane's titles, forged a false letter against her own husband and Queen Anne, her sister, by which they were both cast away. And there's another slightly later source, a bishop writing in the 17th century, who says that Jane was spiteful and jealous of George. So, a wicked wife, a woman of no sort of virtue, and the infamous Lady Rochford. But the evidence that these early historians refer to seems remarkably thin. So let's start at the beginning and examine the facts. We don't know exactly what Jane looked like, but I have here a sketch that just might be her. It's by Hans Holbein, who was the most famous painter of the Tudor court. You knew that you were somebody if he painted your portrait. And what strikes me looking at this woman is just how young she is. She looks very innocent too. But then again, she's staring straight at you. And the more I look at those eyes, I just wonder if there's a bit of mischief behind them. Rather than some innocent young girl, is she actually an arch manipulator? 
to understand more of Jane's privileged world, I want to explore what we do actually know about her, starting with where she came from. Jane was from landed gentry. Her father, Lord Morley, was a baron and served Henry VIII at court. He was a well-respected advisor and scholar and good friends with Thomas Cromwell, Henry's chief minister. When Jane was around 15, her father managed to place her as a lady-in-waiting to Henry's first wife, Catherine of Aragon. In the Tudor court, this was one of the most prestigious roles a young woman could gain. But what would Jane's first steps at court have been like? I'm meeting with Dr. Katrina Marchant to find out. So Jane arrives at court as a lady in waiting or a maid of honour, the bottom of the pecking order. Would she have had to have worked hard? She absolutely would, especially if she wants to be noticed so that she can rise up the order. They can start around dawn. So Jane is going to need to be up and dressed, ready to go along with her mistress to prayers. And then, of course, she will be there to entertain and keep company with her queen. She might play games, perhaps card games, dancing, singing, storytelling, reading aloud, filling the rooms of her queen with entertainment when called upon. So, Kat, as a new arrival at court, what would Jane have been wearing? Well, when Jane turns up at court, she turns up as the daughter of a baron. And what people can wear is incredibly codified. In fact, it's legislated in things called acts of apparel. And as the daughter of a baron, she is entitled to wear items like this, which is made of green velvet. She's also entitled to wear cloth of gold or cloth of silver. And that's not your regular gold lame or anything like that. That is something that's made of spun, actual precious metal that's then wrapped around silk and woven into fabrics. There's an awful lot to learn for Jane, isn't there? She has to learn very fast. Oh, she absolutely does because a faux pas in this context could be devastating. She is not entitled to wear purple, for example. That's a royal colour. If she sees somebody wearing purple, she knows that they are due reverence. That quite literally means how deep she curtsies, that she lets them go through the doors before her. It might seem like a glittering prize to get a job at court serving the Queen, but it's quite a harsh place. It certainly is, and Jane is incredibly fortunate to have gotten this place. Because to turn up there at 15 as a maid of honour, this is a glorious finishing school, where she can look around and learn how to be a great lady. With a role so close to the Queen, Jane was one of the most eligible women at court. And in the Tudor world, that only went one way, marriage. St Giles Church in Great Hallingbury, Essex, is probably where one of the most important moments of Jane's life took place. In 1524, Jane married. It was a match that would have been arranged by her father, Lord Morley, an opportunity to marry upwards in the Tudor world. Jane was marrying into the famous Boleyn family. At its head was Thomas Boleyn, a feared and respected diplomat and one of the king's favourites at court. Henry must have supported the marriage as he paid for half of Jane's dowry. Jane came with an impressive sum, 2,000 marks, about £600,000 in today's money. We know that her father, Lord Morley, arranged a jointure a sort of Tudor prenup, so that Jane would have some money if something happened to her future spouse. Although it was an arranged marriage, Jane was lucky. George Boleyn was clever, charming and charismatic, and he was also the same age as her. He came from a family whose star was ascending at court, so even if it wasn't a love match, Jane's future would have looked very rosy. At this point, Jane had no idea just how far she would rise. But in the ruthless and ever-shifting world of the Tudor court, nothing was guaranteed, as the Boleyns would discover to their cost. <laughs> 
This is Hever Castle, the Berlin family's main residence. 20-year-old Jane had just married their only son, George. He would have brought his new bride back here to live at his family's country seat in Kent. George's sisters, Anne and Mary, were already known to Jane as they were both ladies-in-waiting at court. I've come here to see the sort of life of luxury and privilege that Jane would have enjoyed as a Berlin. Hi, Owen. Hello, Tracy. How are you doing? Nice to see you. I'm meeting with Dr. Owen Emerson, the historian at Heva. So this is the best bedchamber at Heva Castle. This is where the most senior Berlins uh, would have occupied during their time here. And when George and Jane were in residence, this would have been their bedchamber. This actual room? Absolutely. Yes. That's so exciting. I mean, it is spectacular. Beautiful bed. You can imagine it's a place of some status. And obviously, as a newly married couple, they'd have been preparing to fill the nursery. Yeah, absolutely. Just as the Berlin children themselves were brought up here, uh, certainly George and Jane would have expected to bring their children up here at Heva. It was customary for brides to spend some time with their in-laws after their marriage, so Jane probably would have learnt how to run her own household. Thomas, her father-in-law, uh, had quite a fierce reputation for being a uh, ruthless negotiator in, in his role as a diplomat. Uh, he's a real go-getter and he's able to secure very coveted places for his daughters at uh, other courts. So a lot of his ambitions surround his family and if you wanted your family to do well, you had to play by those rules. You have to be a bit cutthroat, don't you, to get on in the Tudor court? Absolutely. Um, betterment was sort of the heartbeat of the court. So Jane perhaps learnt more than just household management when she was here at Hever. Very much so. Uh, she was surrounded by very shrewd uh, political players. I love the thought of them here plotting their next move once they're back up in London. Absolutely. This is where they strategise this is at the Berlin headquarters. In 1525, just a year after they married, George was promoted to be a gentleman of the King's Privy Chamber, one of the most prestigious roles a young courtier could have. It meant that he got to be close to Henry at all times. In fact, the Berlins were spending less and less time at Hever and more time at court. George Berlin was a very attractive figure at court. He was well liked and popular. George is granted the title of Viscount Rochford when his father moves up to the, the post of Earl of Wiltshire. It's a very prestigious title for him, particularly for such a young man. He is allowed to occupy more space at court, so the title correlates to a much wider physical presence in the court itself and more people at his disposal. George is very much treading in his father's footsteps in regards to becoming a diplomat for Henry, going on missions and getting things done. Uh, and he's, he's very able at doing so. And as long as he's able to stay in the king's favour, he's going to succeed, and so is his wife. She becomes a Viscountess. It means that she has increased status at court, so she's allowed to take precedence over other women, particularly those maybe at dinner. She sits higher up the table, so it's an important move up for her too. Jane, her husband and her father-in-law now held high-level roles in Henry VIII's court. But then something happened that could bring them even further into the king's inner circle. 35-year-old Henry became besotted with the clever and cultured Anne Boleyn, the family's youngest daughter. Jane would have been well aware of this affair. There was very little secrecy at the Tudor court. And besides, she and Anne were family. They both served in the Queen's household. Anne may have confided in Jane about the affair, and she might have even shown her some of the King's passionate love letters. There's a particularly famous one here where Henry refers to being in great agony because above a whole year he has been stricken with the dart of love. 
So it's very clear the King is absolutely obsessed with Jane's sister-in-law, Anne. We don't know for sure, but perhaps Anne confided in Jane that she didn't want to become one of many in a long line of Henry's mistresses who could easily be discarded. Anne was playing a much longer game. She wanted to be Henry's wife. If Anne became Henry's queen and gave him the male heir he so desperately needed, all of the Boleyns, Jane included, would be at the very top of the court. But Henry couldn't secure a divorce from his first wife, Catherine, because the Pope refused to grant it. For seven long years, Henry gave the Boleyns land and titles as he chased Anne. All of them, including Jane, would have benefited from his favor. This puts Jane in quite a dilemma because family loyalty ties her to Anne, but her position at court in Catherine's household pulls her another way entirely. So was it a case of divided loyalties? Jane would need to play it shrewdly. Eventually, Henry managed to secure a divorce from Catherine of Aragon by breaking away from the Catholic Church. Jane had served Catherine for just over a decade, but now her sister-in-law was going to be the next Queen of England, and that could only have been good news for Jane. In January 1533, Jane was probably present when Henry and Anne Boleyn got married in London. Anne was given a special coat of arms to show her rise in status, a falcon as well as lands and further titles. Henry wanted something in return, a male heir. Jane must have been delighted. Her sister-in-law was now the queen, taking her and her husband George even higher up the ranks of the cutthroat court into the king's inner circle. Anne's marriage to Henry and her new status as queen can only lift Jane up further in the social hierarchy. She is now, by extension, a member of the royal family. So Anne becoming queen is marvellous for Jane. With Anne's rise, Jane can see a, a massive improvement in her status at court as one of uh, the, the ladies of the bedchamber for Anne Boleyn. Uh, this would have given her increased privileges at the best table, at the banquet. And she would also have much better accommodation at court. Jane is now tied to Anne Boleyn. Anne Boleyn's fortunes are tied to hers. If Anne Boleyn rises, so does she. That's how it would be in the natural sense. As the sister-in-law to the queen, Jane was now at the top of the tree. Not only that, as lady of the queen's privy chamber, she had unique access. She could move within all areas of the royal palaces. So when Anne became pregnant, Jane would have been by her side to support her. As one of her ladies, Jane Rochford is there at the birth. What would that have involved? What role would she have played? So when a queen or a high status woman is pregnant, she has a period of lying in where she will retire to her rooms, she will be locked away from the gaze of men, and she will be surrounded by her ladies. And Jane Boleyn will be there to assist with the birth. She will be there to keep company. She'll be there to witness it, to make sure that this is a rightly born heir. In September 1533, the longed for baby was born. But Henry could not hide his disappointment. It was a girl. How did Jane feel after the birth of her niece? Maybe there was a tinge of sadness or even envy, because by now she'd been married to George for almost a decade, yet they had no children. And in the Tudor world, children were everything. Every family needed a male heir to continue the line. 
Well, the fact that George and Jane had no children has led to speculation that their marriage was unhappy or perhaps that George was gay or indulged in affairs with other women. There's a contemporary poem that claims his appetite was all women to devour. Is this just a piece of Tudor slander? Or actually, is there some truth to it? Another idea historians have considered is that George preferred to spend time with his sister Anne rather than with Jane, which bred in Jane a hatred for the Queen. In the drama Wolf Hall, this tension is powerfully portrayed in this scene between Anne and Jane. Do that again and I will hit you back. You're no queen. You're just a knight's daughter. These different theories may have provided great material for scriptwriters, but so far I found no solid evidence to back them up. In fact, there's another episode from the royal marriage which I think could suggest Anne saw Jane as an ally, not an enemy. Not long after his wedding to Anne Boleyn, Henry started a relationship with another woman. The details of this incident are not clear. It may have been a flirtation, it may have been something more. But what we do know is that Anne was furious, and in order to get rid of her love rival, she enlisted the help of her sister-in-law, Jane. So we have this um, uh, fantastic record uh, by someone called Eustace Chapuis. He was an ambassador employed by Charles V, who was the most powerful man in Western Europe. And it's wonderfully um, explanatory. The ambassador Chapuis writes, of late days, Lord Rochford's wife, that's Jane, conspired with the concubine, that's his name for Anne, to procure the withdrawal from court of the young lady whom this king had been accustomed to serve. The story goes that she and Anne schemed to remove a potential rival from the king's affection from court. We're not quite sure what this scheme was, but it was clearly something that was intended to make this other lady look bad and have her sent away. But the pan backfires and it's Jane and not this lady who is banished from court. But why did Jane hatch this plan with Anne? It proves Jane's loyalty what it doesn't tell us is her motivation. If Anne was no longer Henry's wife, Jane would lose her status at court. So was she acting out of friendship for Anne or out of self-interest? In any event, the scheme failed and Jane was cast out. She had no idea when or if she would be allowed back to court. Jane probably returned to Hever with her tail between her legs. Her banishment wouldn't have done her husband any favours either because, of course, he was closely associated with her and it's all about reputation at the Tudor court. Her banishment would have also served as a very stark reminder of just how fragile life was at court. You might be high in the king's favour one moment and out on your ear the next. But could Jane turn this impossible situation around? Jane Boleyn had been cast out of the Tudor court and was back at her family's home. Her banishment might have been embarrassing for Jane, but it was also a sign that all was not well in the marriage of her sister-in-law Anne and King Henry. And that was something that worried all of the Boleyns. Then in May 1536, the Tudor world was shaken. After three years of marriage, Jane's sister-in-law, Queen Anne, was dramatically arrested. Later that day, Jane's husband, George, was also seized by Henry's men. Both Anne and George were brought here to the Tower of London. The arrests must have scared Jane, but what happened next was truly terrifying. Jane was called for questioning 
by none other than the king's ruthless chief henchman, Thomas Cromwell. Henry, it seemed, wanted out of the marriage, and he'd given Cromwell the task of carrying out his wish by any means possible. Anne and George were both accused of treason. Anne was accused of adultery with five men, including her own brother, George. The incest charge is a stroke of genius on Cromwell's part. He really needs to tarnish the Boleyn's reputation in order to justify what he and the king are about to do. And one of the ways to do that is to repulse the court and the jury as to the charges against both the queen and her brother. And what better way of doing that than by uh, inviting the, the notion of incest? It's been speculated that the accusation of incest came from Jane, who's been painted as a spiteful and vengeful wife. It was said that Jane carried many stories to the king to persuade that there was a familiarity between Anne and her brother. It's a storyline that's been repeated time and time again. My husband George is always with Anne. He's her brother. It's natural. There's nothing natural in George. And nothing is forbidden. I've seen them kiss. Brothers may kiss this. His it. tongue in her mouth, hers in his. But despite years of scouring the history books, I've discovered no actual proof that this claim of incest came from Jane herself. And Jane's next step was a surprising one. We know that Jane attempted to go and see her husband, which in itself was a very risky move because prisoners weren't really allowed visitors. They were supposed to be starved of contact with the outside world. But one of the king's officials left an account of Jane's attempt in this respect. And he wrote that he was commanded in the king's name to allow a visit to Rochford from his lady wife and that she was hoping to humbly submit his case to the king. And for that, George gave thanks. But why did she really want to visit George? Was she gathering intelligence that Cromwell could use at the trial? Or was this an act of a loving and loyal wife, desperate to see her husband? Whatever the state of her marriage to George, without his protection, she was in a terrible predicament. She had gone from being a sister-in-law to the king to the wife of a man imprisoned as a traitor. On the 15th of May, 1536, Anne Boleyn stood trial. She entered a plea of not guilty. We think it's unlikely that Jane would have attended the trial, so she was spared the humiliation of hearing Anne accused that she'd tempted her brother with her tongue in the said George's mouth and the said George's tongue in hers. One of those sitting in judgment would have been Jane's own father, Lord Morley. Anne put up a spirited defence and there was little evidence for any of the accusations. But the die was cast. Henry wanted rid of Anne and his lords found her guilty. Next in the dock was George. If Jane's sister-in-law, the Queen of England, could be so easily cast aside, what chance did her husband George stand? But George had been a loyal servant to the king for over 10 years, so could that be enough to save him? George too entered a plea of not guilty. Again, we think it's unlikely that Jane would have attended her husband's trial. So she wouldn't have seen that at the start of it, he began to win the courtroom over. George is doing what he does best. He is fighting and there's every evidence to suggest that he's doing incredibly well. 
Chapuis, the Spanish ambassador, tells us uh, that there are odds of two to one uh, that George will be acquitted till Cromwell hands him a piece of paper and tells him not to read aloud what that piece of paper says. But George defies him. The note that Cromwell handed to George contained sensitive information about the king that Cromwell did not want to share with the 2,000 people assembled in the room. And he reads, namely that his sister had said to his wife, Jane Boleyn, that the king was impotent. Now, this is an explosive revelation to be made in the court and an embarrassing one for the king. This is why they didn't want George to read it aloud. This is the turning point because George tips over from being confident and successful into being arrogant and pushing his luck because he directly contravenes this instruction he's been given not to read it aloud. To Henry, it would seem as if his capacity as a man and as a king is being laughed at. Now, ridicule is something that a Tudor monarch can't take because ridicule can spread. So what finally damns George is this very private conversation with Anne where she questions her husband's virility and that's an absolutely treasonous thing to say. For whatever reason, Jane allowed this secret to get out into the open and that puts everyone in danger. She is questioned by Cromwell and it's possible that she says something indiscreet. But I think with the turmoil that's going on and potentially how skilled of an interrogator that Cromwell can be, it's understandable that she might have had a moment where her lips were loosened. So Jane has now put George in a very difficult position because George now knows something about the king that he shouldn't. And this means that he himself, his own life now, is in danger. It's probably been done innocently, but it is going to be used and the effects are going to be damning. When the verdict was called, they found George guilty of both treason and incest with Anne. That meant only one thing. On the 17th of May, 1536, George was beheaded just outside the Tower of London. Anne's execution was held inside the tower just two days later. Both Anne and George's bodies were brought to the church within the Tower of London and laid to rest in an unmarked grave. Was Jane racked with grief, or was this a moment of triumph for a scorned wife who'd plotted the downfall of her husband and sister-in-law? We will never know. But if George's death had been part of Jane's plan, she had made a terrible mistake. Without George, she had no protection and no prospects. All of his lands and property, which were hers too, were now confiscated by the king. Just three years earlier, she had been the sister-in-law to the queen and king of England. Now Jane was a near penniless widow of a convicted traitor. The only thing that was hers still was the title Viscountess Rochford that George had inherited. <laughs>
father. Things looked bleak, but she hadn't been at the Tudor court for 15 years without learning how things operated. For Jane to survive now, she would have to call on every resource she had. But she must have been wondering if her head would be next on the block. Jane Boleyn had just seen her husband and sister-in-law, Anne, executed. Short of money and stripped of her assets, she needed the aid of her husband's family. But her father-in-law, Thomas Boleyn, was in no mood to help. After the death of George and Anne, Thomas, their father, is a broken man. He retires here to Hever. So Jane, at this point, has to rely on that prenup that was agreed at the point that she married George. It doesn't appear that Thomas is particularly forthcoming at this point. Thomas did not honour her prenup, so Jane made a calculated move. She turned to the one man she knew could help her, the very same man who had convicted her husband and sister-in-law and who had ultimately sent them to their unmarked graves. But it was a risky manoeuvre. Jane wrote to Thomas Cromwell, Henry VIII's trusted advisor and one of the most powerful men in the kingdom. Incredibly, the letter still survives and it's a real thrill to see something in Jane's own hand, particularly as she may have written it here at Hever. Well, what this letter is essentially is a cry for help. And it's obvious from the start that Jane isn't putting on any airs and graces. She's far superior to Cromwell in status, but she knows that she needs his help. She's desperately short of allies. She calls herself a poor, desolate widow and goes on to refer to her lamentable case. Well, I think this letter, for all its humble tone, shows that Jane is prepared to be bold. She might be a woman in a man's world, but she knows how the Tudor court operates and she's prepared to do whatever it takes to survive. Jane's gamble paid off and Cromwell came through with his help because he secured her the money she wanted from the Berlins. Thomas Berlin agreed to pay her £100 a year, over £60,000 in today's money. Jane could now survive, but what would she do? She was no longer a part of the royal family. Henry, now 45, seemed to quickly put the Berlins behind him. Just 11 days after Anne's execution, he married again. His new wife, 28-year-old Jane Seymour, was gentle and dutiful. As the new queen assembled her household, some at court would have been surprised to see a familiar name in her list of ladies-in-waiting, Jane Boleyn. This was hard to believe. The widow of a convicted traitor allowed back to a position of power and not just as any old lady in waiting, but a lady of the privy chamber, the queen's private and personal space. It really was an incredible reversal of fortune. I've come to Hampton Court, one of Henry's most important palaces, where Jane would have served her new queen. I'm meeting Tudor historian Elizabeth Norton. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, Tracy. Nice to see you. And you too. Should we go in? Absolutely. We know that Jane would have worshipped in this chapel alongside Henry and the rest of the royal household. I want to find out how on earth Jane managed to wheedle her way back into court. So, Elizabeth, Jane Boleyn returns to court after the execution of her husband and her sister-in-law. What must life have been like there for her? It's quite surprising to find Jane Boleyn as a lady-in-waiting so soon after her husband's execution because it's such a privileged role. Ladies-in-waiting are absolutely at the top of the pile at Court for Women. It's a really, really prestigious role and one that is incredibly sought after. So no wonder Jane wants to come back. You might think that she'd prefer to stay well away after everything that's happened. She is the widow of George Boleyn, 
the sister-in-law of Anne Boleyn. And of course, George has just been executed for incest. So people must have been looking at her. She must have felt self-conscious because there would be whispers, you know, people saying, what's she doing here? Why is she here? You would expect her to hide away, but she doesn't. It's a real balance in that, you know, she's had some terrible, terrible things have happened to her connected with the court. She knows the dangers of the court. But equally, it's like this bright light. It sort of draws people in because it's where everything happens. And it's where all the glamour, you know, it's sort of the Hollywood of its day. And Jane Boleyn, of course, is back. I think Jane's return to court tells us about her resilience. It tells us that she is a go-getter. And also it tells us of her shifting uh, circumstances. She needs to make good on her own. It is extraordinary that Jane is able to return back to court. It shows that Jane has immense capacity. Or it shows that perhaps she's working for somebody else. And she's needed at court to perform that duty. Is it that Jane Boleyn is a good servant? Or is it that she's actually working for Thomas Cromwell and that she's been placed there as a spy for him? I think it's very probable, considering that Cromwell has interceded uh, on the question of her prenup and her finances, that part of the bargain of him doing so was that she would act as something of a confidant uh, or even a, a spy on behalf of Cromwell. Cromwell couldn't get into the Queen's apartments. He needed someone in there. If Jane was his eyes and ears, Cromwell could continue to influence Henry's court, but even he couldn't control what happened next. Jane Seymour gave birth to the male heir Henry so desperately needed, Prince Edward. Less than two weeks later, she died. Henry was distraught. The king and the country were plunged into mourning. With the new queen dead, Jane Boleyn was suddenly out of a job. For more than half her life, the court had given her status and purpose, but now she had no role. But Cromwell, ever the schemer, had a plan for the grieving Henry, and Jane Boleyn would be part of it. In 1540, he found a new wife for Henry, a German princess. But this was not the most promising match. Anne of Cleves was half Henry's age and new to the ways of the English court. The young queen had a lot of adjusting to do, and Jane was hand-picked to become one of only six English ladies-in-waiting to help her. I think Cromwell very likely is placing Jane Boleyn back into the Queen's household uh, when uh, Henry marries Anne of Cleves. You have to remember that Cromwell was the architect of this marriage. He needs to know everything that's going on. He needs to know if it's successful or not. And who better to rely on for this information than Jane Boleyn? With Jane in the King's inner circle, she'd have seen how Henry and Anne of Cleves struggled with their relationship and how Henry's eye was soon caught by another lady-in-waiting, Catherine Howard. It's likely that Jane fed all of this information back to Thomas Cromwell, who'd brokered the marriage between Henry and Anne of Cleves. Its failure put his position at risk. So within six months, Henry was desperate for a way out of the marriage. He just didn't find her attractive. And Jane Boleyn was called into service to help facilitate this because while Henry was gathering his evidence, and making his case to end his marriage to Anne, one piece of evidence comes from Jane herself and some of the other ladies in waiting where they reported a conversation that they claimed to have had with Anne of Cleves about her sex life. 
And famously, she says, well, of course I can't be a maid, this is the Queen, because the King comes to bed with me every night, he kisses my hand and calls me sweetheart. Is this not enough? Jane is then able to tell people that this marriage hasn't been consummated. And non-consummation is a reason for a marriage to be annulled. Anne of Cleves is a German princess. There's just no way that she could have had this intimate conversation with Jane Boleyn and her fellow ladies-in-waiting at that point. It's just impossible. She just didn't have the English. So I think the only conclusion is that Jane made it up. She's perjured herself on behalf of the king to ensure that his divorce goes through. The court was full of opportunists. They moved with Henry's wishes, and so Jane was happy to do that as well. By testifying against Anne of Cleves, Jane was helping Henry. But this wouldn't have helped Thomas Cromwell, the architect of the marriage, whose power was now waning. Jane might have judged it was time to shift her allegiances. Jane made her move just in time. A few weeks later, Cromwell was executed at Tower Hill for treason. We'll never know for sure if Jane really was a spy for Cromwell, but what is certain is that his death served as a stark reminder that the favour of the king could change with the wind. Henry's next choice of queen was the flighty and beautiful teenager Catherine Howard, who, unlike Anne, he found attractive. She also just happened to be Jane Boleyn's cousin by marriage. Somehow, the canny Jane managed to once again survive at court and was chosen to serve her fifth queen. Although Jane was now in her mid-thirties and Catherine was still a teenager, they appeared to really hit it off. And before long, Jane was one of Catherine's closest confidants. So Jane Boleyn is back. She is serving her fifth queen, her fifth wife of Henry VIII. And it's clear that Catherine starts to rely on her and to lean on her and to take her advice. And she quickly becomes preeminent in the queen's household. She's right at the top now. She's not just one of the ladies in waiting. She is a lady in waiting that Catherine Howard turns to. What's Catherine's court like? Well, she does bring a lot of her childhood friends with her. The ladies that she'd shared a bedchamber with. So it's a teenage court, this group of young teenage girls. It must have felt like just wrangling a bunch of cats. With a new queen that Henry loved on the throne, his court seemed to finally settle down. Henry called Catherine his jewel. She was one of the few people who could lift his black moods. Perhaps Catherine would successfully produce another male heir for Henry. But just a year after the marriage, Henry received news about his queen that changed everything. And we know exactly where he was when he received it. As Henry was at prayer here in the chapel at Hampton Court, a letter was quietly placed next to him. It's thought to have been written by the Archbishop of Canterbury and its contents were explosive. The Archbishop revealed to Henry that his new wife was not a woman of such purity as had been assumed. In other words, Catherine before her marriage had taken other lovers. Henry asked his ministers to question Jane and the other ladies in waiting to find out if there was any truth to these rumours. As the secret investigation progressed, more and more damaging information came to light about Catherine's past. One name in particular was revealed in the investigation, a young favourite of the King's, Thomas Culpepper, who it was claimed had been secretly meeting with the Queen. Faced with accusations of adultery, the Queen was arrested. 
It's said that she broke free from her guards and ran screaming along this corridor, desperate to reach the king and beg for mercy. But Henry had already left Hampton Court and would never see his teenage wife again. Throughout all of this, Jane Boleyn was probably very close to her mistress's side. She perhaps even watched as Catherine was seized and led away. As Catherine's favorite lady-in-waiting, Henry's men wanted to further question Jane. Jane would surely have been terrified. She had a darker secret to hide, and if the king discovered it, her life was in danger. Once again, Jane Boleyn's world had been turned upside down. She had survived two decades in the ruthless court of Henry VIII, but now her mistress, Catherine Howard, was under arrest for adultery. And, as Jane was her closest confidant, the screw was about to tighten for her too. The Queen's lover, Thomas Culpepper, was next to be arrested. He was sent to the tower and his rooms at the palace searched. Incredibly, the evidence they discovered there, a letter, still survives. What they found was explosive. A letter from Catherine to Thomas Culpepper. And what Catherine writes is that Culpepper should come when my Lady Rochford is here. Essentially, then he'll know that the coast is clear. And what this letter makes plain is that Jane knew that Culpepper and the Queen were meeting in secret. Other servants and ladies-in-waiting were pulled in for questioning, and the truth slowly came leaking out. The Queen's ladies testified that Jane would run messages between Culpepper and the Queen, and that she would find places where they could meet in secret. They said every night the Queen, being alone with Lady Rochford, locked and bolted her chamber door on the inside. That was damning evidence against the Queen and Culpepper, but also against Jane, who was placed right at the heart of the affair. The evidence suggested that Jane Boleyn had not only had an intimate knowledge of this affair, but had helped it take place. What on earth was she thinking? She's seen monarchs, female monarchs, fall. She's seen that sexual politics can lead to a woman's downfall. She's an experienced woman at court. She knows of the dangers of a queen being accused of adultery. She's seen it firsthand with Anne Boleyn. She knows this. And yet, she facilitates the relationship. You know, Catherine is this young girl who relies on her. She's a re relative. Actually, perhaps she takes pity on them. She sees them as these young lovers, frustrated lovers, and resolves to help them out. I think we should consider that Jane is doing what she had always done at court. Uh, she'd been of good service to her queen. She's prepared to break the rules when the queen demands it. Or could Jane have been playing an even riskier game? It might be that somebody is suggesting that she should help. Perhaps Catherine's own uncle, himself a very powerful, the head of the Howard family, Perhaps he thinks that we need a Howard boy in the cradle of England and he is worried that Henry is no longer up to the task. Does he suggest that Thomas Culpepper, as a distant relative of Catherine Howard's, might look enough like her that any child born of their union won't be questioned? So this pregnancy idea could be a real possibility. After all, Jane knew from her time serving in Anne Boleyn's household that the king was impotent. And she also knew how dangerous it could be for a royal wife not to give him a male heir. So perhaps her plan was to help 
Catherine conceive and therefore safeguard her position as queen, but also safeguard Jane's position in Catherine's household. Well, if that was her strategy, then it was a huge gamble and it would backfire spectacularly. Once the letter was discovered, everything changed. Henry might have been able to forgive a more minor indiscretion, but an adulterous affair right under his nose was a different matter. An account of Catherine and Culpepper's questioning still survives. It's amongst Henry VIII's papers. Both Catherine and Culpepper hold out against these questions and insist that they only met to talk. But when Culpepper is forced to swear an oath to his testimony, this is what he says. He describes many stolen interviews with the Queen. And crucially, from Jane's point of view, he says that Lady Rochford contrived these interviews. But it's about to get worse. He goes on to claim that Lady Rochford provoked him much to love the Queen and he intended to do ill with her. Well, he's essentially thrown Jane under a bus. He's made it clear that the whole thing is entirely her fault. Jane was hauled in for questioning, and finally she broke. She admitted that she thinks Culpepper has known the Queen carnally. It's quite incredible that Jane admitted to knowing that Catherine had slept with Culpepper. But why does she let this slip? Well, I imagine she was under intense pressure, but she must have known that by admitting this, she, the Queen and Culpepper were now all doomed. Thomas Culpepper was sentenced to death. Catherine and Jane were now held at the tower, waiting for their futures to be decided. Henry was furious that Jane had aided and abetted an adulterous affair between his jewel, Catherine Howard, and one of his favorite courtiers, Thomas Culpepper. Jane had survived five queens, but could she find a way out this time? In her distress, the records tell us that Jane was seized with raving madness. Jane was kept here at the Tower of London. She must have known it was unlikely that the King would take pity on her this time around, and her mind began to rapidly unravel. The Tudors were surprisingly sympathetic towards those who were considered to be mad or lunatics, and the law stated very clearly that if you were of unsound mind, you could not be put to death as a result of your actions, because you couldn't be held accountable for them. So was this apparent madness just an act put on by Jane to save her skin? I don't think there is any evidence to suggest that Jane would have known about the laws about executing those deemed to be insane. And I do think she is having a, a serious mental collapse at this point. She must have been absolutely terrified. Uh, she's treading in the footsteps of her sister-in-law and her husband. And um, it, it must have been an absolutely horrific prospect to be in the position that she was. Incredibly, whilst Jane was at the tower, Henry sent his own physicians to cure her. Was he prepared to forgive Jane one more time? Or was she heading for the executioner's block? Music
Jane Boleyn had been accused of aiding and abetting an affair with Henry's fifth queen, Catherine Howard. Whilst under arrest at the Tower of London, she had gone mad. King Henry had even sent his doctors to cure her. Does she think that this is a sign that a reprieve's coming? That her former brother-in-law, her friend, her king, is looking to make her better so that she can return to court and to court life? Of course, it turns out he's just making sure she's well enough to kill. Because it used to be that it was illegal to execute somebody who was mentally unsound. Even though Jane would have been protected by the law as someone who was displaying these signs of insanity and frenzy they described her in, as in the tower. Henry was so furious with what she'd done and he was so used to getting his own way that he deliberately repealed this law to make sure that she received the death sentence. Jane has survived through so much at court but finally she is at the centre of that spider's web and nothing is going to get her out of it. She is trapped and there's only one way out, and that is death. Unlike Thomas Culpepper, Jane and Catherine did not stand trial. In January 1542, Henry opened Parliament, and one of his advisers outlined the case against the Queen and Jane. Jane was described as that bored, the Lady Jane Rochford, and both she and Catherine were found guilty and sentenced to death. Jane would have the dubious honour of being the first lady-in-waiting to face execution. On the 13th of February, 1542, Jane, still only in her late 30s, would have been taken here to Tower Green, where they'd set up the executioner's block. We think that about a handful of people gathered to watch Jane's final moments, and one of those present recorded her last words. I have a copy of them here. Well, not unlike her sister-in-law Anne and her husband George, Jane asked for forgiveness and also praised the king. She said, I have committed many sins against God from my youth upward in breaking all of his commandments and also against the king's royal majesty very dangerously. So my punishment is just and deserved. Now, this sounds like an admission of guilt, but in fact, it was customary for members of the nobility to be very humble when facing death, because to do otherwise could bring retribution against their loved ones. So Jane's final act was to try to keep her family safe. With just one blow to her neck, Jane was executed. Her body was brought here to St. Peter's, just yards away from where she'd been beheaded. Both her husband George and sister-in-law Anne had also been laid to rest somewhere in this church in unmarked graves. The Berlins were now all together. 300 years later, the Victorians decided to mark Jane's resting place with a stone at the altar. It's likely that her skeleton was mixed up with the body of Anne Boleyn, who lies just a few yards away. But I think it's not just her grave that history is confused, it's also her reputation. In history, we like to paint people as either good or bad. Jane gets painted as being bad. And she is often blamed for the execution of Anne Boleyn and the execution of George Boleyn. The picture of Jane that we have been left by history is of a bitter, jealous woman, an angry wife and a miserable sister-in-law. Essentially, she's pretty toxic as family members go. I think she only made one real mistake in her life, and that was facilitating the meeting between Culpepper and Catherine Howard. For that, she paid heavily with her own life. In Jane's home church in Essex, 
where she married George Boleyn, is, I think, a more generous reminder of her life. Jane's mother paid for a bell to be cast in her daughter's name. The whole of Jane's family would remember her every time it told on Sundays. But hidden at the back of the church is what I think is an even more fitting tribute. When Jane's father, Lord Morley, died, it's thought that this statue was created to mark his tomb. Well, the design that was chosen is quite telling, I think. It shows a cadaver, an image of death, but at the feet is the head of a girl. And it's thought that that is a reference to his daughter, Jane, who was beheaded. I think it's very moving that all the way up until his death, Jane's father still had tender feelings towards his daughter, still wanted to mark her passing, even though she was a scandalous figure, a villainous figure in the eyes of many in Tudor England. But to Lord Morley, she was clearly a cherished daughter. Nearly 500 years after her death, the myths about Jane Boleyn still endure. The lack of knowledge we have about Jane has contributed to this vacuum into which people have poured this interpretation of Jane as the villain. But this is based on speculation, rumour and comments of, of later writers. And most of it is being written during the reign of Elizabeth I. And when Elizabeth's on the throne, no one's going to want to write the story where her mother is the victim or her father is the murderer. And if neither of these things can be true, we need a scapegoat. And Jane Boleyn is a really useful one. Jane is very much this scarlet woman built up to bring down these queens. But actually, what we know of Jane is devoted wife courtier, career woman, if you like. And it's very, very different from the pictures that has been painted from within a few years of her death. Having explored the events of Jane's life, I can't help but think that her reputation as the most hated woman in Tudor England is grossly unfair. True, she's not exactly blameless. She may have been a spy for Thomas Cromwell at some point, and she certainly facilitated Catherine Howard's affair with Thomas Culpepper. But Jane was also capable of intense loyalty, both to her family and to her queens, often at great personal cost. It seems that there were two Janes, one the loyal lady-in-waiting, the other who would do whatever it took to survive in the ruthless court of Henry VIII. It's almost as if events of her life have been simplified in order to create her into this kind of baddie. But, as in life, everything is altogether more complex than that. I think Jane Boleyn's history is due for a rewrite.